Hi everyone, thanks Dave. Welcome to this webinar hosted by ASC and the ASC Education Foundation. I'm Jennifer Holland, Assistant Vice President of Marketing at ASC. I wanna to welcome today's technician audience. Technical information serves a role just as important as the tools for diagnosis and repair. That's what today's session is all about. Diesel after treatment systems continue to be misunderstood and misdiagnosed even though they've been around for a good while. To address this, today we're privileged to have two presenters from Isuzu Commercial Truck of America, otherwise known as ICTA. John Reno, Manager, Center of Excellence, will start things off and then we'll hear from Andy Curtin, Manager, T National Training and Uptime Support. Okay, let's connect with John Reno now in Scranton, Pennsylvania. John, over to you. Hey, hello everybody. Uh, it's good to see you. Happy Friday. Um, just want to make a shout out to all you guys who are out there trying to uh, uh, learn a little bit more. And, uh, you know, I always say, um, uh, if you're not learning in this industry, you're going backwards quickly. So uh, my uh, partner will be uh, Andy. He'll, co he'll come to you a little bit later. All right. I'm going to turn my uh, camera off here uh, so you can see the screen a little better. All right, uh, like I said, uh, my name is John Reno. Uh, I work out of the, our East Coast Training Center. Uh, and uh, I started out uh, about 30 years ago in Ohio Diesel Technical Institute in Cleveland. Uh, then I proceeded to uh, go into uh, an Isuzu dealership, uh, which was also a Mack truck and Great Danger dealership. Um, for the last five years, I've been uh, putting a training center together for our East Coast operations. Andy works at the one on our, our West Coast op uh, operations. Um, you might uh, have seen our little white trucks running around. Uh, I've heard other people call them that. And um, we have uh, gasoline and diesel trucks, the smaller N-series trucks uh, come in gas and diesel. We also have a crew cab. And recently we've added a higher GVW, what we call our FTR. Um, we've actually have been, uh, since 1986, we've been the number one uh, low cab forward uh, selling truck in the United States. Um, our trucks, uh, cabin chassis with a diesel, four cylinder diesel engine in, uh, come into these four ports. Uh, they come in as a cabin, cabin chassis. Um, we have our corporate office out in California where Andy is, and we also have offices in Plymouth. We have an office in, in Canada and also in the southern region of the United States. Like I said, uh, I'm in the uh, training center in Scranton. We call them our centers of excellence. Andy is out in Anaheim, Calif uh, Anaheim California. Um, all the technicians from all of the United, all of our dealers in the United States and Canada come to either one of these two training centers to get trained. We also do some fleet training in in these centers. We have three different main parts distributions throughout the country, located in California, Ohio, and in Pennsylvania. Um, in Charlotte, Michigan is where we manufacture our gasoline and trucks, uh, all of our trucks with gasoline engines, and also our, our higher GVW uh, diesel FTR chassis is put in Charlotte, Michigan. Like I said, we do have about 350 uh, dealers. Uh, as you can see, I've got a lot of them real close to our training center here on the East Coast. Uh, and uh, like I said, we do, we do serve, we do have a, ga a diesel engine and a gasoline engine. For the purpose of dis today's discussions, we'll be focusing mainly on our most popular diesel engine, uh, the 4HK. Uh, it's been a very good engine. When it comes to emissions, uh, we've been dealing with emissions for quite some time, although ever since 2007, uh, we have, uh, it's really become on the radar, has become part of our industry. But uh, emissions really started back in 1994. This graph here kind of talks about uh, NOx and particulate emissions. So from 1994 to 2010, emissions have been drastically reduced. Uh, and as, as, uh, as uh, and I'm sure no one's surprised, there are more, more to come. So a little bit about our 5.2. Um, in 2005 to 7, we introduced on this engine the common rail fuel system. Um, believe it or not, this common rail fuel system is a large part of emissions. Um, up until this time, we were injecting uh, diesel fuel at about 3,500 PSI. 
once common rail fuel injection came into play, we are now injecting diesel fuel at 25,000 PSI. So if you can imagine the droplets of fuel coming out the tip at 3,500 PSI versus 25,000 PSI, the droplets are much smaller at 25,000 PSI. The other thing that has a big changer with common rail fuel injection is we were really limited to one injection per stroke. So you're really limited to the position of the engine and the speed of the engine. Uh, that's why we used to time injection pumps. With common rail fuel injection, it's not like that anymore. We really have, we are not limited uh, at all. If there is fuel in the rail, we can inject fuel at any time. And in fact, in the next, when the diesel particulate filter comes out in the next uh, series of engines, we actually injected diesel fuel on the ex on the exhaust stroke to do a regen in this in the second half. Uh, EGR, this was uh, EGR is used to control NOx, so EGR has been put in there. Now, when we get down to 2007 to 2010, like I said, we were using the diesel particulate, the, the common rail fuel injection to actually dose fuel on the exhaust stroke, therefore putting raw fuel down the tailpipe for a regen, which we'll talk about later. In this era, we also added a second EGR cooler. The reason is because we're flowing more EGR. The EGR is to control the NOx uh, gas inside the cylinder of the engine. So we were flowing more EGR, so we needed more cooler. We've also added an electronic intake control on here. So that's uh, the ability to control uh, the air and to increase EGR flow, actually. Also, around this time, many manufacturers like us had to seal up their crankcases. Basically, uh, the road draft tube that was familiar on many trucks going down the road was gone. Anything that is created inside the cylinder or inside the crankcase had to go through the engine and out through the after treatment systems. Uh, in this era, we also uh, deployed a variable vane uh, uh, a variable vane geometry turbo, or uh, uh, we now have in the similar way that we took control of the fuel system and we can inject fuel at will at any time we want. Um, we now take control of the turbocharger. So the turbocharger electronically can vary the amount of boost in the engine to meet emissions at all RPM ranges. Um, so that has been a real game changer, that, and that is all for emissions and for, for particulates. Then coming to 2011, um, uh, we added a downstream injector after the turbo so that we did not have to dose as much fuel on the exhaust stroke for the regeneration project. Also at this time is we added selective catalytic reduction. This is a second after treatment. It is not a bigger after treatment system. It is a second after treatment system. It is an after treatment system to do a completely different task than the first after treatment system. Other things to note, in 2016, we actually add a sensor to, to, to uh, monitor the quality. But there's also a particulate matter sensor at, right at the end of the tailpipe. So now if the DPF filter actually becomes uh, breached and is allowing us to pass, this sensor will pick it up and allow you to know that you have a bad DPF. And we've also started monitoring the crankcase pressure here in a fuel shutoff solenoid at this point. Here's an overhead shot of our engine uh, with the cab tilted up. As you can see, our common rail fuel injectors are under, under the valve cover. As you can see, we have a pr two pretty good sized EGR coolers. Uh, our fifth injector is down here right after the turbo uh, and our variable vane turbo. Uh, one thing I like to point out here is a mass airflow sensor. Uh, very important. This sensor uh, calculates the volume and the density of the air coming into the engine. So the air that enters the engine, as long as there are no leaks, has to go out through the tailpipe. So the exact volume and density of the air coming in the air filter has to go through the engine, be part of the combustion process, has to go out the exhaust pipe. This is very important uh, because most ECMs, no matter what truck manufacturers, we, know, we need to know the volume and density of the air going through the engine so that we can use that to calculate the restrictions on our DPF system. Um, here, here's our boost sensor. Here's a picture of the intake valve, and our EGR valve is right over here on the uh, on the man manifold. Another here is our two after treatment systems. Over here is the front of the truck, and our the exhaust enters. The first component uh, that it hits is what we call EGT1. 
So EGT-1 is actually measuring the temperature of the exhaust that is coming out of the engine. So after that exhaust comes out of the turbo and comes down the pipe, it is entering the front of the first after treatment system. And then right after that, in, right in here is the DOC. So the second component is the DOC. It's a dual oxidation catalyst. It is where much of the heat uh, of, for a regeneration is recorded. The next component is EGT-2. So now we know the temperature of the exhaust before and after the DOC. The ECM later on, we'll, I'll show some graphs and we'll see that these two are very important center sensors to judge the integrity or the quality of, an, of your uh, regen. Then right after here, after that, we have a diesel particulate filter. The diesel particulate filter is really nothing more than an air filter. It has to be made out of ceramics so that it can withstand the temperatures, but it is nothing more than an air filter. Um, that air filter, when it gets plugged, we have a, something called a regeneration. We have the ability to reduce the size of the debris that's in there so that we can continue on. Uh, if you'll notice, there are these little steel pipes here before and after the filter, and we have what we call a differential pressure sensor. So taking information from that mass airflow filter sensor that I talked about, if we, take, if we know exactly what volume of air is coming through the systems, if we look at the pressure before the filter and after the filter, we can calculate the ECM can calculate how plugged is that filter getting? Is it time for a regen? Uh, is it, and, will, and that's also the process for setting codes if there is a fault in the system. So then we have, so that is the, basically the first after treatment system. The second after treatment system really starts here by measuring the amount of NOx. So we're really working on particulates up here. So we measure the amount of NOx. The exhaust turns, comes down through here, here is a diesel exhaust fluid injector and a long tube. The hot exhaust coming through the first after treatment system will take that death fluid, turn it into a fog or a steam, and it'll mix. And it will enter into another catalyst. And this, this area is the area called the catalyst, which, which is the area where NOx are converted. So we're taking uh, NOx and we are converting it into nitrogen and water. Then we also have a sensor out of, coming out of the SCR system, uh, which is NOx sensor two. So between the inlet and the outlet, these are the two sensors that give feedback for the second after treatment system to determine its level or efficiency. So we have two temperature sensors to monitor the efficiency of this system and a differential pressure sensor, and we have NOx sensor. Some, some manufacturers will call it inlet and outlet NOx sensor. Uh, uh, there's lots of different terms. So this industry has a, a lot of different terms. So there's a slide kind of uh, looking at the DPF function. The DOC is a catalyst. Uh, and the definition of a catalyst, I heard a good definition. Uh, it basically is a something that uh, will cause a change to whatever substances hit it, but it won't change itself. So it causes change, but it doesn't change itself. Also, the DOC being a catalyst, if you hold it up to the light, you can look straight through it. So as the exhaust goes through here, whatever the composition of the DOC is, it will react and it will burn unburned hydrocarbons. And if we were to dose fuel on this through our injectors or through our after treatment or hydrocarbon dosing valve, whatever term you want to use, we can generate heat on here as part of a, a, a with a, a catalytic event, we'll create heat. Also, this is a good diagram of the filter. As you can see, the filter, it comes in, and down here is a good picture of it where the exhaust comes in and actually these side walls, it moves over to this wall and goes through. So these are actually a filter. And if you look at this picture, you can see every other hole is, has soot in it and every other hole is cleaned. So this is a, a good indication of, of how, how, how it works. So here's another drawing of, of, of the piping that goes through it with our DOC and our DPF filter and, and how it folds together. Here we took one and uh, we in the training center and uh, technicians love nothing more than to see something taken apart. So we cut it in half. So as you can see, here is what we call our dual oxidation catalyst. This is where a lot of the heat for our regen is, is created. And this is nothing more than a ceramic air filter. Um, the ceramic air filter, uh, it uh, ours, uh, 
it, you need to be, uh, we have an interval for cleaning them. Uh, every 100,000 miles or 3,000 hours is usually what it'll, what it'll take, barring any unforeseen, anything unforeseen. So then we move on to the SVR system. As we we're saying, this is where the first after treatment system ends. The second after treatment system, uh, we start with our knock sensor, we inject F, and we actually have a catalyst in here. There's actually two catalysts in there. Uh, the first catalyst, or ours actually have two, there's a set of catalysts, I'll show you a picture here shortly. Um, they are the ones that convert NOx. And then there's this, the last catalyst we call a slip catalyst, which actually takes the leftover ammonia from the NOx conversion and converts it to water and nitrogen. So we're taking a bad gas and we are uh, converting it into two, two good ones. Um, this temperature here, 374. 374 is the degrees that the, these bricks that we call the catalyst bricks, that's how hot they need to get to before they're ab even able to function. So our trucks don't even start uh, can, uh, injecting DEF fluid until we hit 374 on EGT3. So when we see the temperature of the exhaust coming into this brick at 374, then we will start dosing. Up until that point, until the system is up to temperature, up until that point, all of the NOx have to be controlled uh, with what we were doing before. We have to use uh, EGR, and we have to use our fuel system, we have to use our turbo to control NOx. But once this is up to temperature, we can actually reduce the NOx after the fact. Here is one cut apart. Uh, these first two bricks are identical. They are where the NOx conversion happens. And then this smaller one is what we call that, that slip cat where they deal with the leftover ammonia. So in, to kind of recap, this, there are, we talk about two after treatment systems, but really a lot of times what gets forgotten about is all the systems up here on the engine have to be functioning. They still have to be controlling particulates and controlling NOx so that the DPF and the SCR systems don't have too much. So our fuel uh, injection timing and our rate control help with consumption, high output. They, take, they help control NOx, they help control particulate matter, and they also control noise. The high pressure helps with the uh, consumption output, but it is, that high pressure injection is to deal with particulate matter. If you, remember, if you remember at the beginning when I talked about the high pressure and how fine it atomizes the fuel and burns it up. So the better you can get that burn, the less particulate matter you have. And our turbocharger, that is also to deal with particulate matter. We had our EGR cooler. The EGR system, the sole purpose of the EGR system is to control NOx. So now, uh, you know, at this point, we are up to where we were talking about in 2007. But these systems all still need to be functioning. Now, in 2007, we are now at treating particulate matter after the inside of the engine. All of this up here happens inside of the engine. Um, then also we added SCR, and the SCR is solely to take care of the NOx that the internal engine system can't do. So we still have to, one of the things that gets forgotten when dealing with uh, DPF and SCR issues is that all of this still needs to be happening up in the engine system so that a DPF system can function normally. So uh, in the last five years, I've gone from uh, running a dealership to teaching technicians. And uh, um, I've uh, been, uh, some of the major con uh, misconceptions that I've come across, and these aren't all of them, but some of the major ones. Um, the first misconception is uh, when either of the two after treatment systems are being nice uh, diagnosed, the source of the malfunction is in the area of the after treatment system. I still get a lot of feedback from our technical supports and other technicians I know and other manufacturers, you know, where they're replacing parts time and time again on the after treatment systems, uh, thinking that if there's a code for the after treatment system, the malfunctioning part needs to be in it. The reality is a very large percentage of the time, the real source of the problem is coming from the engine systems that are malfunctioning and causing the, uh, the after treatment system or the exhaust coming to the after treatment system to be abnormal. So uh, that, is, that is it. The, uh, oops. So the second misconception is the two after treatment systems work together at the same time. Uh, many manufacturers have been putting it all into a container and putting heat shields around it. I think one box is a term called, and there's some other terms out there, but uh, some people think that it's all working together as one. In reality, they are two separate systems. They're in series, 
uh, in the same exhaust system, and the heat from one gets the other one up to temperature, but they are really doing two completely different tasks at different times also. Um, so uh, the third misconception is that all the heat uh, from a re for a regeneration comes from the DOC. So uh, re in reality, the engine needs to be in, uh, in the end, all the systems in the engine, the intake system, the exhaust system, the fuel system, all of those systems need to have control of the temperature and the emissions inside the cylinder. Just because we added after treatments uh, doesn't mean we can clean up anything. So we still have to have good control of it that's inside there. If the engine is not creating enough heat, the DOC usually cannot cre uh, create enough heat to compensate for the heat that the engine is not creating. Also, if the engine is creating too much heat, then the uh, DPF system will overheat. And that usually causes damage to the SCR system also. The fourth misconception is that particulates are completely burned off. Uh, there, while there is some of that, a large portion of those particulates are merely reduced in size. Um, they are reduced, uh, and uh, on our trucks, uh, for example, uh, our trucks need to have us it's serviced uh, every uh, 100,000 miles or 3,000 hours. Um, and uh, uh, so the fil some of the filters need to be, uh, I mean, the, uh, sorry, the particulates that have been reduced inside are still inside that filter. So like I said at the beginning, the DPF is nothing more than an air filter that's made out of ceramics to endure the heat. You know, think about this concept. Would you run the air filter in your car to the point that the engine stalls and then you need to get it towed? and then you change the air filter. So that has been a, a, a problem in this industry. Basically, uh, after treatment systems need preventative maintenance. There are service intervals. That's why we suggest 100,000 miles or 3,000 hours. The other issue is the application. You know, uh, one of our customers uh, it uses them in an, air, in, the, in an airport. Well, they never, they, it'll take a long time for them to get uh, uh, 100,000 miles on it, but they get lots of hours, so they have to look at hours. So application needs to be a big part of your judgment on how to take care and uh, service uh, after treatment systems. The fifth, fifth misconception I'd like to talk about is people think that the SCR is part of the regen process. Had several technicians, you know, say, ah, I can't figure out this regen. I've replaced the def injector and it still won't do a regen. And they just, again, missing that concept that the SCR system is part of the regen and it's not, it's a separate system. And in reality, the only relationship is that the heat that passes through one gets the second one up to temperature so that it can actually do its job. The sixth misconception is one that is, is probably the biggest one. Um, the replacement of parts in either of the two after treatment systems will give you instant feedback as to whether your diagnosis and your repair were correct and successful. Uh, the reality is that after treatment systems, many of the codes use the word efficiency. So efficiency uh, basically says that it takes time for it to diagnose and look at this. So uh, the ECMs that are controlling and monitoring the after treatment systems, they have to analyze the performance of these systems over time and over distance. And it may include various operating modes or driving cycles. This is the big misconception where, you know, uh, we've taught technicians uh, to, to, you know, we get a code, we measure the resistance of the sensor, it's out of range. We put a new sensor in it, the code goes inactive, we clear it, and it's gone. We get real instant feedback that we fixed it. Um, after treatment systems, not so much. Um, to steal a phrase from a, a, a guy named Keith Littleton who teaches electrical, um, he teaches this when he's comparing uh, you know, our test light and DVOM methods to oscilloscopes. He talks about having a dynamic approach to solving problems rather than a static approach. So in the static approach, we just look at a value on a screen. We say that part's bad, we replace it, the value comes correct, we clear the codes, we go. Well, in after treatment systems, we really need to think about over time. Um, so as an example of that, uh, most diagnostic tools, uh, whether it's OE or even some aftermarket, a lot of tools now uh, have the ability to graph data. Graphing data is a dynamic approach to solving a problem in an after-treatment system. Uh, 
This here is a, about 20 minutes of data uh, for a region. Um, this, uh, this first line here is actually the red line is uh, EGT1. If you remember, that's the sensor just before the, the DOC. EGT2 is the green line. Uh, and if you'll notice, uh, at the beginning of the regen, the engine starts to increase the temperature of the exhaust. Right here, these lines here are my after treatment fuel injector. And then the yellow line is EGT3. This is the temperature of the exhaust going into the after, right before it goes into the SCR system. So if you notice, the heat starts to climb. And right here, this is actually 490 degrees. At 490 degrees, that is when our system. So we're using the engine. We're actually using some post injection. We're using the exhaust brake. We're using that intake valve. We're using all of the systems in the engine to get that heat up to the point so that that DOC is to the point where it can inject a fuel. Uh, the, uh, it's, the ECM starts to inject fuel, and right away we start to see the temperature sensor after the DOC start to increase. Um, I try to, when I'm teaching technicians, when you want to know if you're doing a regen or not, when the temperature sensor after the DOC significantly passes that of the exhaust coming into it, now you know you're doing a real regen. If this line does, stays down below it, you know you're not really doing a regen and you have to look for issues. Now, the other thing to note here is, see how these, this data just kind of goes on nice sweeping curves and it just goes up. Our regen gets up to about 900 degrees for about 10 to 15 minutes. And the last five minutes, we achieve about 1100 degrees to get a, to get a good regen. Also, so these three sensors are the ECM's feedback as to whether its control that it is controlling is working. So if you see small changes in the amount of control, the ECM is just looking at the data for these two sensors, making small amounts of control, and now we have a quality region. We have reached 1100 degrees. The soot that is accumulated has been reduced in size as much as it can, and now the, the, the truck can, can continue on. So the next slide here is a slide of, of, a, of a truck. And um, this was a customer complaint was frequent regens. So if you'll see the temperature uh, uh, of EGT1, so this is the temperature of the exhaust coming from the engine. So the engine uh, exhaust is actually increasing, but you see it actually hits only about 600 degrees. And if we go back one slide, we actually achieved 800 degrees coming from the engine in this good regen. And if you'll notice, 800 degrees came from the engine, and we only added about 300 degrees uh, from the, from the uh, DOC. Here, the engine only achieved about 600 degrees. Uh, and here's another thing we noticed. The temperature sensor after the DOC, as soon as it starts injecting fuel, the temperature quickly started to rise. Soon the ECM realized that, well, we're climbing way too fast and it turns the fuel off. Then the temperature drops, it turns the fuel back on. It starts to climb again, turns it back off. You see the wild swings in the temperature and the wild swings in the amount of control. Uh, in the, in the, the one previously, we, it only made minute adjustments to its control and had very smooth uh, feedback from its sensors. Here it's having to make drastic swings and it's getting drastic, uh, drastic, res re uh, drastic results. So the customer's complaint was actually a frequent regen. What actually was the problem is this engine had a mechanical failure. And the mechanical failure was a scored cylinder wall. That scored cylinder wall uh, resulted in higher crankcase pressures pushing uh, high uh, crankcase vapors into the through the engine and pushing extra particulates into the DOC. And those particulates, as soon as we started to raise the temperature, those particulates started to burn, uh, burn also. A lot of times when somebody sees data like this, they're looking and solely focusing on the after treatment system, thinking there must be something wrong with this after treatment system, when in fact there was actually nothing wrong with this after treatment system. This this truck actually needed a new engine, not a new after treatment system. So the exhaust coming into this system was that that the after treatment system could not keep up with it because there was uh, too too much uh, basically a blow by and it had a scored cylinder wall. All right, here is. Uh, 
another dynamic approach to looking at the SCR system. So this is a truck and uh, uh, I took this truck, uh, took it out for a road test and my red line and green line are my inlet and outlet knock sensors. So remember, I said those two temperature sensors on the, D, D, on the DPF system, we're analyzing the DPF system. These two knock sensors are giving the ECM feedbacking and making an analysis. So this truck, I actually started up cold. I started recording data long before that SCR system was up to temperature and it started injecting fluid. This yellow line is the rate of injection. So if you'll notice, as this engine warmed up, the, the inlet and outlet knocks were all being controlled by the cylinder. As you can see, we've reached close to 250 parts per million, but the inlet and outlet knocks basically mirror each other. So that tells you that there is no change. So for these first few minutes, there was really no change in the SCR system. The SCR system really wasn't doing anything. But as you can see, when the rate of uh, DEF fluid started to becoming injected, you can see the, uh, the, the uh, downstream uh, knock sensor starting to just slowly come down and we virtually eliminate all that, all, uh, all of the uh, NOx gases in the system. And if you'll see them, how quickly uh, it, can, it, it can react to the NOx coming in versus the no NOx going out. So again, this is a good uh, indication of, 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 of a, a good working SCR systems. One of the time, things I try to teach guys when uh, 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 doing diagnostics is if you have a tool that can, uh, that can graph data for you and can record uh, record a road test, uh, that is the, a great way to take a truck that's functioning normally, record some data, and go back and view it. That is probably one of the best teaching aids that you can ever teach yourself, is to record data and look at what it's supposed to. You know, every one of us as technicians, uh, you know, we always had a short road test and a long road test. My long road test happened to go by an ice cream shop, and I've, I've heard that happens quite often. But uh, you know, if you understand what good data should look like on your road test, on your environment, with your climate and uh, your terrain, and you know what uh, what an SCR system, how quickly your SCR system gets up to temperature and its ability to convert NOx, when you run into one that is not working properly, uh, you will it'll stick out like a sore thumb. Now, this is that same truck. As you'll note, the red line is the NOx coming in and going out, coming in, uh, increasing and decreasing, coming into the SCR system. As you'll notice here, I, uh, I this truck here, uh, I, it was the same truck as the previous slide, but I uh, went out and I sabotaged the DEF injection system. I made it so that the ECM didn't see electrical fault or a mechanical fault, but it really was not injecting any DEF fluid anymore. And I started recording data and started the truck up. And what you'll notice is the knocks were way down here because there was still DEF fluid saturated into that, uh, that uh, catalyst. But the further I ran the truck, that SCR basically started to dry out those catalysts and the DEF fluid. And as, as after we went down the road, after a while, you start to see the inlet and outlet of the knock sensor start to mirror each other. Also, these yellow lines, look at the extreme measures that the ECM is trying to stake. When you see wild swings in the control, that tells you that the ECM is struggling to get this system to work. If you look up here, Look at the very minute adjustments that the SER system was making to its injector, and it was getting pretty quick feedback. Here it is struggling to get it. Um, this truck, uh, the SER system was failing, but it did not set a code because I would have probably needed to, it would have probably needed to see this for another driving cycle uh, before it actually set the codes. <sighs> So um, we have two resources, isuzutruckservice.com. Um, if you don't work for an Isuzu dealer, right, you, this is a website where you can get uh, service information, you can purchase diagnostic tools, uh, and you can get uh, much information from, from, uh, from isuzutruckservice.com. If you're looking for any of our dealers, isuzucv.com is where you can find a dealer locator and looking for the closest dealer uh, near, nearest you. At this point, I'm going to turn it over to my partner in crime, Andy, uh, so that uh, he can uh, finish uh, finish out our presentation before we start answering some questions. All right. Thank you, John. That was a really good session and sharing the information with uh, over 1,700 attendees that we have here today, which is a fantastic turnout. So thank you, everyone, for your time on this Friday afternoon. 
And uh, if you're all passionate enough to be in this ASD seminar and hear what we have to say about this stuff, I would also like to appeal to you all uh, in this next little segment here. And this is access for students. Well, what do I mean by that? I think most of you out there are uh, happily employed service professionals, or I think you are. And what I want to do is share some information for you that we are trying to further uh, tackle this national technician shortage issue that we're all dealing with. And we're offering information to any co-op or vocational or technical or universities or colleges. Those of you that are at a Suzu dealerships or are considering switching to a Suzu dealerships and supporting our brand, uh, we have resources out there to help up and coming service professionals get a head start. So what we have prepared for students that are considering careers in this field, and you know, John and I are both recovering technicians that have chosen a, a little different path in our professional careers here, so we both know the, the game. But what we have is a subset of our module activity for students. And we share this information, and uh, if you have a program or are currently working with the school, reach out to us, we'll share some instructions to start that relationship. But uh, for those of you that aren't in the Isuzu circle, here's a little bit of a peek of some of the things that we cover with our technicians. So we have the foundation, you know, missions and driver orientation, that's kind of terminology, and what are all those different lights on the instrument cluster of our trucks? What do they mean? Uh, electrical fundamentals, because I think everybody can agree that that is really the start of anything in this world, you know, especially today's technology. Parts components, fleet value service parts, that's our second line or value line. And we have a lot of different terminology, even amongst different OEMs in the medium and heavy truck space. We refer to things by different names, so we want to get everybody acclimated to that. And then we have a set of modules for the, our proprietary uh, Suzu diesel technology, and then also our gas-powered product, which is about a 50-50 split of our uh, production lineup. And then we have some Suzu unique content with our new model, Class 6 FTR, and then some other kind of People skills are referred to, customer handling, fix it right, uh, RO documentation, because as a technician, you're not just a diagnostician and a repair person, but you also need to have technical writing skills to complete that repair order and thoughtfully convey the things that you're doing on that vehicle to justify the time spent and the hours and parts charged. Keeping the customer informed, again, customer experience is a huge thing today as all of our vehicles seem to get a little bit closer in the technology and uh, what they provide to the end customer. The experience is what starts to make the difference and we're very focused on that here at Isuzu. And then we get into success on the service drive. That's kind of a service advisor thing, but not all technicians want to be technicians forever. There's a lot of other roles within the dealership. So there's some information about how do you segue into the advisor and onto uh, possibly management. And then tech efficiency is how to be a more skillful technician and turn those hours. So next slide, John. So this is a learning path for our dealership technicians. Uh, for those that are in our CZ dealers today, this is familiar to you, different way to look at it. But we have 13 online modules that largely feed in as prerequisites to our hands-on training. So the red column in the middle, those are all of our hands-on courses that we currently offer. We have uh, three different engine platforms. John spoke about the 4HK, which is our primary production for the diesel engine. We also have a smaller diesel engine, a three liter, we call it the 4JJ1. It is uh, no longer in production in our lineup, but we still have a lot of units and operation out there in the market. So we continue that training program. Uh, as I said, about 50% of our lineup is gas. So we spent some time training on that. And we have a very nice three day electrical class that we're very proud of. Uh, we have the, what we call breadboards to build basic circuits in front of you, hands on in our two training centers. And then that segues into uh, going out in the shop and working on complete vehicles and also serves as laying the foundation to our diagnostic courses, which we're also very proud of. And uh, those have become really well recognized in the industry. And then we cover all the other bases, much like uh, the ASC testing series does. We get into HVAC, the driveline, and then steering suspension and brakes. So all said, uh, about 18 hours of module activity at this time, and we're working on expanding that because we continue to have more and more technology and information that we want to share with our technicians. And uh, currently at 20 training days to become a fully certified ACV technician. Uh, next slide, please. 
So this is one of my last slides, and we can open up for questions. But really, <clears throat> again, appealing to those of you out there that do have some Isuzu influence in your current role, whether it's at your dealership, or if you have a relationship with a high school, technical, vocational, university of some sort, um, you can reach out to Ann, myself or John Reno, and we can have a conversation about that and see if there's a relationship that we can help form there. Again, you, you're all out there as technicians attending this webinar. That means you're passionate about learning, you're passionate about the, the job of a service technician, which I think is critical to the success of our industry. And maybe you'll be continually passionate about getting others into this industry and realizing that it is a great career choice. You don't necessarily have to do that four year degree thing and get into all that debt. I won't dive into that too much, but there's a lot of opportunities out there for young individuals or even uh, seasoned individuals and veterans that can choose this path. And we wanna be a supporter of that. So reach out to John or myself and we can provide some additional information on that. And go to the last slide and I think that's it. Yeah, and I'd like to just add on to what Andy was saying. You know, I'm sure there are many of you out there like that were like me. You're a shop foreman or you're a service manager uh, and you're working with a local high school or a local college program. Um, I remember, you know, the, the pains of trying to get good talent and many of these instructors. So even if you're not an Isuzu dealer, but you have a school or a program that could use some uh, some of our online content, you know, we're, we're here to move the industry forward too. Obviously, we, we're uh, me and Andy are... Uh, looking for the success of Azuzu, but we also want to move the industry forward. So if uh, if you have schools or programs that you work with that are supplying technicians to you and they can use some of our materials to get into this industry, uh, that's what we're all about. So at this point, we'll hand it back to Dan, Dave, and Jennifer for uh, questions and wrap up and go from there. All right, great. Thanks, guys. Dan, as you go ahead and queue up the first question and get that spooled up, I just want to make mention to everybody that after this session, within a, a week, probably be just a few days, but there will be a follow-up email that will be coming out to you that will have a list of resources in it. And one of them will be the uh, slide deck, since some people have been asking about it. There will be a link to the slide deck that you can get from that link. So I just want to make sure that everyone is aware of that. Dan, you got one queued up? Sure do, Dave. All right, great job, John and Andy. And here from Edwin, it's more a comment uh, of, and then leads to a question from another participant. And the comment is that the scan data uh, graphing that is really key to success on a lot of diagnostics. So another uh, attendee asked, what tool was being used to show that graphing? Yes, uh, we actually have our own tool. That uh, the the uh, website Azuzu Truck Service, we actually have a company that uh, makes our own tool. Uh, you can get a a a, la a a tablet version of it, or you can get a PC. So if you go onto that Azuzu Truck Service .com and you hit go to shopping, you can actually purchase that tool. We call it an IDSS, Azuzu Diagnostic Information Systems. So uh, that that's what it is. Um, you know, it's it, you know it's not uh, it, it is probably the best tool for ours and it and it works uh, qu quite a bit. Um, our Azuzu dealers actually have, uh, you know, they have tech support guys. They can actually look at even data beyond that and engineering level data that comes from databases. You know, Japan is actually using this dynamic approach to improve the quality of our vehicles. So they are pulling data off of trucks at, at mountains of data, and they are looking at data not only dynamically, but in a dynamic way nationally and globally to try to make their product product better so that dynamic process so yes that azuzu truck service you can purchase all the tools that i just showed you there today uh you can and inside the tool is all of our workshop manuals service bulletins everything everything is there for per uh, for purchase uh, there's a lot of free information on there too there's uh, access to uh, uh, uh different information uh, uh, some videos on on our trucks and things so i uh, the azuzu truck service.com and azuzu cv.com uh, there's a lot of information that you can you can find out there I hope that answers your question. I do appreciate you repeating the website because the uh, questions pane blew up with that. <laughs> so thank you. Uh, yeah. Also, I'm then provide, I'm also going to provide a, a a copy of this so for ASC to distribute. So my, you'll be able to go back through some of my slides if you'd like. Awesome. Uh, and then uh, from Edwin, he said that there was a tip that you gave about the temperature rising when the injector 
injects and the exhaust temp sensor rises uh, drastically. And he said, that's when you know it's doing a regen. So he really appreciates you sharing that tip. And then others had asked uh, to re, uh, restate that. So I'm hoping that answers that question. Okay. Well, um, the comment that I use in class is I, I say, so we have a, the DOC, which is a catalyst. That's where uh, you remember that extra 300 degrees that was created in a regen. There's a temperature sensor just before it, just after it. The temperature, sensor, the temperature sensor EGT1 tells me what the temperature of the exhaust coming in from the engine. EGT2 tells me the, the temperature of the exhaust after it passes through the DOC. My statement is this, you are not doing a real regen until EGT2 considerably passes one. So you need to see an increase of the temperature from the temperature coming into the DOC to the temperature going out. Uh, that's when you're doing a real regen. If those temperatures stay very closely or, you know, one of the, one of the scenarios, if the uh, after treatment fuel injector uh, fails on one of our trucks, what will happen is uh, the temperature EGT2 will get right to within just about 50 degrees of EGT1, which tells me that it's actually cooler on the outlet of the DOC. That tells me that there is no fuel hitting the DOC and we're not actually creating temperature. If you can understand the feedback of, that the ECMs are doing from the sensors and look at how much it's drastically trying to change its controls to do it, you can make some really quick judgments on a system uh, that's not even setting codes yet. Thank you. Um, and then there are literally a couple thousand people here today. So uh, there are boatloads of questions asking about the cleaning of the DPF, the diesel particulate flu filter, yes. and how that is accomplished in your world. Okay. Um, many dealers are getting their own cleaning machines uh, just for convenience of the customer. Um, so some of our dealers' networks have their own machine to clean them. Uh, SPX was a company that came out with one of the other machines. But now there are different ones out there. One of the approaches that Azuzu has taken is we actually have an exchange program with our dealers. We have a brand of parts called Fleet Value. So there, are, Fleet Value is a part that actually meets OE but is sourced here in the U.S. So what we do is we have uh, filters already clean sitting on the shelf. Uh, most uh, filter cleaning systems, if you have a quality cleaning, it usually takes 12 hours because usually what they'll do is they will go in and they will bake it at real high temperatures to get all of that soot that's in there reduced even for as, for as far as it's possible. And then they usually blow it out with air. I've heard that there are some water solutions, but usually if you take the filter out of your truck, have it sent out, it's usually an overnight uh, fix. Our, uh, we've set up a system in our dealers where they can actually get an exchange unit. Um, there is a way of testing it to make sure that that the ceramic structure of the filter is, uh, is is okay. It's not cracked or busted. And then you just simply exchange it. You take the old one out, put it back in, and it can be a you know one day turnaround time or or less sometimes, uh, depending on the dealer how how you know how the dealer works on it. So that is our approach. So some of our dealers clean them themselves, but we've put an exchange program trying to get our uh, our customers up and and running. Because if the wheels aren't turning, our customers aren't making money, and we aren't either if our customers aren't making money. Jonathan asks if uh, Fleet has a uh, vehicles that do a lot of stop and go driving versus highway driving, would that result in the uh, increased after treatment system problems that he's running into? Absolutely. Uh, that was part of my reason for making a big emphasis on uh, the mileage and the hours. Um, uh, one other other manufacturers actually will actually look at the gallons of fuel used as a barometer for your application. Um, you think about after treatment systems, you know, back in the day when trucks used to take off from a st stop sign, we all saw the black smoke. Well, when a truck is starting and stopping, that's when and after the truck gets up to speed, that smoke would usually clear up. Well, if you just think about that same application, even though our fuel systems and air systems are very advanced and we can really control that smoke inside the cylinder, still at the point where you're starting and stopping, you uh, are making the most amount of particulates. So if that's your application, you will need to clean your DPF filters more often and you will need to focus on hours uh, and do that. One of the things, that, that's why I made that statement about uh, would you wait till your, your uh, car stops running to change the air filter? 
Well, that's the same concept. You got to think about that. If you're running in an application that's building a lot of a lot of soot and a lot of start and stop, idling, you know, the temperature's not up to temp uh, up to temperature, a low temperature operation, you you may want to change your air filter more often, which means servicing your DPF. So it's you know it's like it's like your car. If you're if you're taking your Jeep and you're going off road, you're probably changing your air filter more often than the guy who's just running out on the interstate. So it's really the same principle, and you need to think about it that way. And uh, that was a big mistake in this industry made uh, it, it, with the DPFs is is not realizing that it's a system that needs to have maintenance done to it. It needs to have maintenance schedules. That's why we at so many miles we change our air filter. Or we're, you know, there's mileage recommendations. So whatever vehicle you're working on. I, most manufacturers have figured out the hours and the miles that it, that, it, that it takes. I hope that makes sense. Thank you. And then uh, Michael is working in a DOT fleet, um, and he says that uh, is it an acceptable practice because a lot of their vehicles idle a lot to uh, force a regen at regular service interval, intervals, say, for instance, 5,000 miles? Yes, we have customers that do that very same thing. You know, we have customers that are in, in the package delivery. So they'll 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 go they'll go 100 yards stop, go 100 yards stop, they'll go three miles to stop. And what they'll do is their their fleets actually made a ha that fleet actually make it a habit of that was part of their evening. Uh, check over of the trucks, the technicians would go up and do a parked regen because it was a controlled regen because it would never complete a good regen out on the road because of the application. Application is something you really need to need to need to look at. So yeah, um, you know, uh, you know, I showed you those recordings of the uh, uh, of the a good regen. Uh, some of our technicians will take our tool, they will start a regen, and they will record it. They can walk away, they'll do something else, they'll come back and just hit look for those key temperatures of a good regen and they know that it's done. Now if a system is failing and they need to watch it like a hawk like to make sure that it doesn't over temperature it's failing, but to do a good a good regen uh, that that's an acceptable practice and other fleets do it. Earl asks about uh something that they notice which is a clogging or a white uh type clogging of manifolding of the fluid, fluid injection system. He's just asking is there a way to prevent that? Or is this just an, an inevitable maintenance item for those systems? Uh, I, I'm, uh, I'm I'm assuming you're talking about the uh, deaf fluid system, and you're finding I would, some. I would say so. Debris in it. Well, that has been a problem for us too. And but but all of that debris has to come from the outside, uh, unless there's something broken or failed. So uh, I would really look at the uh, the uh, cap for your deaf fluid. Uh, we've run into a few customers where the container you know, that they're getting their deaf fluid from uh, is an issue where they're pumping it out of a bulk container into a shop box. So that debris usually almost always comes from an outside environment. So uh, cleanliness is very important in that deaf fluid. You, 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 you can't have it dirt getting in there. Uh, and there, and most deaf pumps have uh, filters and screens in them. Uh, and they're usually more than one. There's one main filter and sometimes there's a, there's a screen in the line. So uh, make sure you understand how to service the pump correctly. Uh, but most outside, it, it, it pretty much has to come from the outside. So something in your system of filling it up would be something I would be looking for your source of your problem. And uh, Christian adds to, I think it was uh, Edwin's comment earlier about the scanning, uh, and it had made a suggestion that technicians take a snapshot of the parameters or temps uh, on a specific unit as it does a proper regen and use that as a base to tackle units not properly doing regen. So that was a tech tip from, from Christian. Ab absolutely. Um, you know, it, <laughs> You know, uh, I used to when I first started teaching diagnostics. Uh, you know, I, I I would tell that that's that's what I used to do. I used to, I, unfortunately back when I started, we were using pencils and paper. And I, what I would do is, uh, you know, I had a consistent road test, and I tried to drive trucks exactly the same way. And I used to record uh, pressures and temperatures and boost pressure and things like that. Well, now we have the uh, uh, the ability to electronically record what it's what it's what's doing. Really, technicians nowadays, if there is an active fault. Um, 
it's not hard to fix. Most of the diagnostic procedures will take you right to the thing, but the truck has to be broken when you're working on it. So many times, the, the guys that are doing heavy duty diagnostics, you're not working on a truck that's broke. You're working on a truck that had codes. You can see the history. You can look back when those codes happen, how the vehicle was being driven when it happened. So you really need to collect data over time. And it's, it's again, it really comes back to that dynamic approach. If you're stuck in that static method, which was how most of us were taught to be technicians, um, you will miss the big picture. Uh, and so you know, uh, you know that that is very important. So that that tech tip is exactly uh, that's how I you somebody figured out what I was. Uh, I got the point across. I guess is what I'm trying to say. If if you you gathered that from my presentation, then I did what I was trying to accomplish. Uh, several attendees asked about the impact of low def fluid level on the trucks and their ability to drive or start. Are there? Can you talk a little bit to that? Well, as far as the def fluid being low, it would have to be empty to affect the system. So def fluid has nothing to do with the engine system starting or anything like that. So the def fluid, it would have to be low enough that it wouldn't inject, and you would see that it wouldn't be able to convert NOx. So the def fluid, the def system, the after treatment systems really should not be involved in uh, how the engine performance starts. So uh, again, that's part of the misconception is so many people are focused on these very complex after treatment systems, which really aren't that complex. They're just a little misunderstood uh, and blaming everything on the after treatment systems. When I would say 80% of the time, the problems in after treat, the problems that manifest themselves in an after treatment system are really contingent contingent damage or they are a result of something happening upstream. So a truck not starting has really nothing to do with the after treatment system, unless of course the after treatment were so plugged that it, it's, you know, the, the exhaust system is basically plugged, but you still got some massive information. And even then your problem is upstream is, so upstream problems are, are the most overlooked things in after treatment issues. Then Tom asks, uh, how does the system handle what you put in quotes, early turnoff, when a vehicle may have exited the highway to, to stop and go city driving, and then the driver parks, turns the vehicle off during the system operation process and or a regen? Sure, if, uh, uh, during a regen, a regen is an event, SCR is a kind of a continuous uh, thing, and once it's up to temperature. So uh, if, if a truck is shut off during a regen event, you know, there's a lot of heat that has to be going, but it doesn't really hurt the system. What that means is if it didn't complete the regen, you know, our trucks average anywhere from 120 to 180 miles before having to do a regen. So if a driver were to shut one of our trucks off in the middle of a regen, probably in 50 or 60 miles, he's gonna need a regen again. So it, it basically what's happened is uh, it will have reduced some of that soot in the filter down, but it hasn't reduced all of it. So it'll be that much quicker until it till it uh, needs to be uh, uh, reduced again. And so a regen will happen sooner. If the truck is still pretty hot, like if he, if he just stopped, uh, got out, picked up a package, threw it in the back of his truck, started it back up and went down the highway, it would probably initiate and start a regen very quickly and, and finish it if it's up to temperature. Francis asks if a uh, turbo fails, creating oil pushed into the uh, DOC and the PD DPF, are those components salvageable? Um, they have they have been cleaned, but it, it it can yes. It depends how hot it got. Um, if enough oil went back there. And if that oil, because oil is a hydrocarbon, just like diesel fuel. Diesel fuel is just a lighter grade of oil than, than engine oil. So if a bunch of oil goes back there, if a turbo fails and the oil goes back there and the engine is shut off quickly, probably you just got a bunch of oil in there. It would have to be cleaned. I would recommend pulling the DPF filter out, taking it out and having it professionally cleaned or exchanging it like, like we do with some of our dealers. And, and you're probably fine. Now, if that turbo was failing at a slow rate, the and it was continued to drive and maybe even a regen started. Uh, and if uh, most of the time what happens is that oil goes back there. And so we have excessive hydrocarbons back there. Not only do we have the, the heat from the engine, we have the diesel fuel going back, but then we have that oil starting to ignite back there. What'll generally happen then is it will get so hot that it will crack the ceramic filter. And then 
that heat in turn will continue on through the cracked ceramic filter and will take out the SCR system too. So if you've got that driver that just wants to try to get it home with a turbo out or something or just drives it too long, uh, you know, a, a, a turbo failure now is a replacement of both after treatment systems. And then many of the folks have commented uh, asking questions about uh, def quality. Have you run into issues? Have you seen issues in the fleets related to poor uh, def quality? Yes, uh, def, def, qual def does have a shelf life. Uh, if it happens to be left in sunlight, it, it uh, depletes even quicker. Uh, so uh, uh, we've had customers, when, it, when this first happened, they bought a 250-gallon tote. Well, they never got through all of it, and then the quality of the def, it deteriorates. So yes, uh, you do not want to keep uh, keep massive amounts of def fluid on because it will 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 deplete. Uh, but uh, you know, most most of the time that it has gone away because most uh, fuel stops have uh, have def fluid right at them, so you're getting getting fresh def fluid. But def fluid does have a shelf life, and bad def fluid will result in, a, in, a, in a, the ability to convert NOx. It won't convert enough. It'll, tr it'll convert some of them, but not quite enough. And over a long period of time, you know, you'll set codes. Uh, and, then, uh, and then hopefully you don't just throw parts at it. Putting fresh def fluid in it uh, could take care of it. So yes. Okay, and then from Austin, um, a question about uh, the ECM comparing the mass airflow MAF sensor to the particular pressure sensors. And uh, could you explain that again and how the pressure sensor readings can indicate how the DPF may be restricted? Well, basically, uh, you know, think about it. If if the mass airflow uh, is uh, measuring uh, uh, the volume and the density of the air, at idle, there's not that much air going in there. There's just enough for it to idle. But at Two or three thousand RPMs, uh, there's a whole lot of air filter. So if you just think about a restriction, if if you're more you're forcing more air through something that's restricted, the more air you force through it, the more pressure you will build up right before that restriction. So the differential pressure it has to use both. It has to know you know how much air is coming in versus the res the versus the restriction. So the two together uh, calculate what the, what the uh, restriction is. So if it didn't know what volume was coming through there, the it wouldn't be able to calculate the restriction just by knowing a pressure differential. Other manufacturers have used, you know, different uh, Venturi tubes or some way, but somehow the ECM has the ability to know what volume of air is coming in. That's also why it's very important. You know, um, we had a customer that, uh, 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 you know, damaged their air filter and a bunch of debris was on the mass airflow sensor. Well, the mass airflow sensor was giving the ECM a valid reading. It was within range. It was not in a range that would set a code, but it was incorrect amount of air. When the mass airflow uh, was reading the incorrect amount of air, it would did, it didn't time when it should do a regen. It also put the wrong amount of fuel into the cylinder, thus causing the after treatment system to get a lot more particulates. So the mass airflow system or the ability of the ECM to calculate the actual Volume and density of the air going through the engine is very important. No matter and, and different manufacturers do it different ways, but um, it, it, they need to know that. And then uh, Ramon asks, uh, "Is the def the uh, the system that we've seen today is that here to stay, or are manufacturers such as Azuzu working on something?" Uh, to evolve this into the next step, asking what what will be the next progression of this type of system. Do you have any ideas? Well, I'm not on the research and development side. I do not know. Uh, you know, I I know that uh, electric vehicles are all very important to a lot of manufacturers, and so there won't be any emissions on those, um, which uh, you know that could be good or bad. Uh, I do know that uh, all manufacturers are trying to take these after treatment systems and perfect them. Um, I am not aware of any different systems out there that are coming down the pike, but uh, this system is actually starting to work uh, pr pretty good. A lot of customers got scared from diesel uh, because of all the, the misunderstandings and misdiagnoses and misconceptions about it. Uh, but, you know, it's a similar experience to uh, the, back in the uh, 80s, cars went through. We were putting EGR valves on cars and catalytic converters 
years and people were taking them off and deleting. Now every car has that type of technology and no one ever knows it because the durability has been built into the product. And I think the after treatment systems are at about at that point too. Now, most people's products are not having issues. Our, our, our latest, the last couple of years of trucks, our warranty costs have, have just plummeted uh, because the, we've very much perfected it. And part of the reason that it's being perfected is the dynamic approach to looking at how these trucks are used and collecting data to know, uh, to keep them working and understanding what the maintenance intervals are. So I don't think uh, the diesel engine and DPF uh, and SER systems are going away anytime soon that I know of. All right. So uh, John and Andy, thank you so much. This is an excellent presentation. A lot of thank yous coming in on the uh, questions pane. So the folks really appreciate your effort today. I'm going to pass this over to Dave Capert. All right, Dan, thanks for managing that. Great job. Thanks to John Reno and Andy Curtin from my Suzu Commercial Truck of America for today's insightful presentation. The details shown here today will hopefully clear up some of the misconceptions related to diesel exhaust after treatment. This webcast was brought to you by ASE and the ASE Education Foundation. For announcements about upcoming sessions, keep an eye on your email inbox. On behalf of John Reno, Andy Curtin, Jennifer Holland, and Dan Baumhart, I'm Dave Capert, and this concludes today's webcast. We hope to see you online at another event soon. So long, everyone.